Mikhail Tal thrice won the best game prize in the Informant magazine. His victory in 1981 over Janos Fleisch is my personal favorite Mikhail Tal game. I really love how Tal conducts an incredible magical attack out of a seemingly simple position in the Karo Khan defense. The game is only improved for me by some interesting and instructive defensive tries from Fleisch. I realize that most people actually have some other favorite Mikhail Tal games, so I've posted a poll here where you can vote for some of his most famous games or leave a comment with your favorite Mikhail Tal game below. As I've already revealed, Tal begins the game with e4 and his opponent responds with the Karo Khan defense. We're not going to get into the theory, but I'll make a few points as we zip through the opening. At this point, black plays knight d7, a little less popular than bishop f5, a move that plagues my soul when I have to play white against the Karo Khan defense, really tired of trying to find an advantage as white in those positions. After knight here and knight here, Tal avoids the exchange on f6, which is the most popular, and he plays the slightly less popular knight to g3, keeping more pieces on the board. We get bishop d3 and then c5, and I want to take a moment to talk about this. A lot of new players are like, hey, what's up with the Karakhan defense? You put the pawn on c6, and then you put the pawn on c5. That's not good chess. That makes some sense, but the strategic goal is very sound. Of course, challenging the white center makes a lot of sense. You're trying to exchange a bishop pawn for a center pawn. Maybe you even get to be the only one with a center pawn left. That could be great for black. And also, tempo is very in, flex, uh, uh, in flux in the opening. Tal has moved his knight three times. You're often dealing with tempos being exchanged through different sequences in the opening, so it's okay for black often in the Karakhan defense to spend an extra tempo pushing pawn c6 and then pawn c5 c3 and then we get a trade on d4 the knight does capture on d4 which means that black has that one center pawn to zero center pawns but it's okay because we're getting a lot of activity for the white minor pieces bishop c5 castles and bishop takes d4 this is really committal black is going to saddle tau with an isolated pawn that is a bad pawn structure but the isolated pawn as many of us know by now is going to give white some extra activity what I find interesting is that I cannot recall other games where Tal played with an isolated pawn. There must be some, maybe there are actually quite a few in his library that I just don't remember very well because they're less famous, but I don't think you often see Tal playing with an isolated pawn. Other attacking players love to do it because they get that minor piece activity, they get some open lines for their rooks. So here for me is a special opportunity to see how Tal would play with an isolated pawn the answer is as aggressively as you possibly can. So we get C takes D4, castles, bishop G5, developing and pinning, pawn to H6, moving the bishop. Bishop just steps back. Black plays knight B6, honing in on the isolated, um, the weak square in front of the isolated pawn. Um, something you're always going to be trying to do when combating an isolated pawn is trying to put pieces uh, in front of it. So knight B6 made perfect sense. Now bishop c2 was played right here. This is a crazy aggressive move, and it suggests to me that Tal already saw that he was going to sacrifice a rook in this game. So after bishop c2, we get knight bd5, and then bishop e5. The bishop was hit by the knight on d5. The queen goes to b6, and then queen d3. This is a very beginner-esque battery, right? You're setting up the bishop and queen, and trying to checkmate on h7. Many, many games between scholastic players have ended with just such a checkmate on h7. Of course, Tal is playing a grandmaster, so there's no way that Fleisch is just going to allow mate on h7, which means that this actually looks like a very, very suspicious battery because black now has the move knight b4. This hits the queen and the bishop because the knight is on f6. You do not have mate right now, so your queen must move. The queen steps back, and then knight takes c2. The queen captures back on c2, and at that point, black is just better, and what did Tau really do here? But that's not what happened, actually. In this position, Tau revealed why he had played queen d3 and what he had prepared earlier with bishop c2. He takes on f6. Now, this is a sacrifice of a rook because black can capture on a1. Black cannot capture the bishop, 
if you capture the bishop, then queen takes h6 followed by knight h5 is mate, queen g7 mate. Or the knight could hop into f6, which is also mate, two very nice mates. You really are not going to be able to capture the bishop on f6 because of these mates. So to avoid being in a much worse position, black is now forced to capture the rook on a1. But he's up a rook, so that's pretty nice. After black captures the rook on a1, Tal does not capture back when he'll end up down the exchange and black will gain time to defend the position. For example, rook takes a1, queen b5. The queen is going to serve a lot of defensive function uh, here, preventing knight h5, for example, and this is a clean exchange down. White has nothing in this position. Of course, Tal wasn't going to go for this, and he's continuing to play down a rook. He plays knight to h5, very beautiful, I think. After knight h5, of course, you still can't capture. Now queen takes is just over right away. You literally cannot stop checkmate next move. You don't even have a spike check. <coughs> However, black does have one really good defense. I should point out a bad defense first. Pawn g5 is a move that does not work because of bishop takes g5. In fact, I'd like to make a quick point here that it's often said of attacking play that to successfully attack, you need three pieces. Three so that you can sacrifice one of them, and then you will have two left to checkmate. We actually already saw that when the bishop on f6 was sacrificed so that the queen and knight could checkmate. This is another example of that. We can sacrifice the bishop in a different way and again deliver checkmate. It's really good that three is the magic number of attacking pieces because it's basically all that Tal has here. His rook on f1 is not getting into the attack, so he's conducting this attack with only three pieces and he's going to continually need to sacrifice one of them to checkmate with the other two. In this position, after the knight jumps to h5, black does have an excellent defensive move, which I find really, really satisfying. I encourage you to pause the video and actually take a moment to solve a defensive puzzle, something that's relatively unusual. All chess puzzles are usually attacking puzzles. How would you actually keep this game really complicated and not just lose on the spot? So the right move in this position is pawn to e5. Giving up this pawn allows both the bishop and the queen to perform useful functions in defense here. If black doesn't play this, then white is going to be able to take on g7 with the knight or the bishop. White is all over the dark squares around the king, and it is a winning attack. But this move really keeps things very up in the air, and it's hard to say whether or not Tal's attack can succeed against best defense after this. After pawn to e5, Tal goes ahead and takes that pawn, which does keep the bishop on f6 defended. You still can't capture the bishop because of queen takes h6. Now, um, black is going to play pawn g5. A moment ago, this was a failure because of bishop takes g5, giving up one of those three attacking pieces to mate with the other two. You still can't take the bishop because knight f6 check followed by queen takes g5 is checkmating. Not as quickly as it was a moment ago, but we're still checkmating. However, after bishop takes g5, black has the very good defense queen g6, a move that was enabled by the sacrifice of the e-pawn. Suddenly the queen attacks the bishop and attacks the knight, and black is successfully defending here. The game actually remains really complicated, but white is not forcing checkmate in this position. At this point, Tao plays a really brilliant move here. I think there are multiple brilliant moves in the game. This one is a highlight. You can pause your video if you want to try and figure out what Tao plays. It is the best move in the position. So Tao plays the move pawn to e6. I love this. Black has just sacrificed the e-pawn to open up the bishop and queen for defense. And Tao gives it right back on the same square to shut down lines of defense. At this point, something needs to capture on e6, and when something captures on e6, it's going to mean that either the bishop or the queen is going to kind of be redundant and not able to defend as well. Both pieces were defending a moment ago when e6 was unblocked, but only one piece is going to defend after black captures on e6. 
really brilliant stuff. The first move that we should mention that is just refuted out of hand is f a6. Capturing with the pawn just runs into queen d3 when this is a crushing threat and the game basically ends on the spot. You might consider here sacrificing the rook, but after knight takes f6, the king can move, the knight can step back. This is a huge threat. You're also able to restore material equality a lot of the time if you wanted it by just capturing here and your attack continues. So I won't really get into further analysis here after queen d3, black is busted. The other alternative that wasn't played in the game is bishop takes e6, but that interferes with the queen's defense along the third rank. So we can go back to our idea of sacrificing one of our minor pieces to mate with the other two. If the pawn takes, of course, queen takes g5 is again made on g7. There is a lot of checkmating on g7 in this game. However, the game actually continues here. It's very complicated. I'm going to give a computer line, something I try not to do, but when the game gets really, really complicated, the best line is often a computer line. Knight f6 check, bishop e3, black tries to trade queens, and you go queen d4. I'm actually going to stop this here. There are variations that you could consider along the way before this, and there's a lot more you could consider after this. But after queen d4, we maintain a really dangerous attack on the dark squares. We're able to go pick up that rook on a1 in many cases, um, and white is basically attacking for not too much of a material investment here on the dark squares. I like Tal's chances very much, although it's really, really complicated. So after e6, Flash played queen takes e6. The best uh, of a bad situation, basically. The queen is still a good defender here, but one thing that black doesn't have is the move bishop g4, so it's going to be difficult to defend with that bishop on c8. At this point, maybe the strongest move was bishop c3, but Tao played a really brilliant quiet move. He plays pawn to h3. The idea here is that black is often looking to get to g4 either with the queen or the bishop. When one of those pieces gets to g4, it destabilizes the knight here on h5. If the knight is forced back to g3, then Tal's attack is pretty much going to end. Black is going to have successfully defended. h3 prevents that move and also opens up ideas of pawn to g4 locking in the knight which also means locking in the bishop, right? The knight and the bishop work together here. So by playing h3 and then later g4, Tal maintains a permanent control over the dark squares around the king, which guarantees him at least enough counterplay against the black king in all the coming lines. So flash plays queen f5, we get rook takes a1, bishop e6, the rook goes back to e1, thinking about maybe rook e5, queen back, g4 because the knight was hit we stabilize it one of those moves that was prepared by h3 and again white is just all over the dark squares around the king you're down in exchange but does it really feel like you're worse it definitely feels like the minor pieces are as good as black's bishop and either rook so it doesn't feel like we've sacrificed much at all in this position the rook tries to get to c2 right supported by the queen right here the bishop steps back to c3 cutting that off, also opening, opening up ideas of knight f6 check, queen e3, rook to d3, and then queen to e5. The threat is queen to h8 checkmate. Black doesn't have a really good response to that, so at this point, Flash decides that there's nothing better than to sacrifice his exchange back, and Tal recaptures restoring material equality. At this point, it's not decisive for Tal, but he's much, much better. I don't know if he can win against best play. Best play here might be, for example, rook d8, just hanging tight and hoping that you can hold on. I don't see a forced win for Tal, neither do the computers, but obviously white is much, much better with a clamp on the dark squares around the king, a great knight against a bishop that's not doing a lot. There's the ability to press for a long, long time in the position. Still, I don't see a forced win. However, black now makes a mistake with king h7, and this is the losing move. Of course, it takes an excellent sequence to point out why this loses. The knight jumps to f6. After the king moves, we have knight to d5 check. If the king steps back, we start to have checks with queen b8, 
which will be decisive. So the king tries to stay on h7, where it was a moment ago. The problem is we now have knight to e7. This move reminds me of the famous Kasparov Karpov game, which I'll link in the notes, where Kasparov's knight and queen outmaneuver Karpov's pieces. It's really fantastic. Again, check the notes. In this position, there's nothing for black to do other than resign, which is what he did, but retreat the queen to g7, and then you have queen to e4 check. You've lined up the king and the loose rook on d3, and you win a full rook in this position. So black resigned after the move 3297. I love that game. I hope that you enjoyed it as much as me. Maybe someone out there also has it as their favorite Tau game. Maybe I have a companion out there in the Tau world. If you like the game, then also check out the playlist that has other Mikhail Tau games. And do subscribe uh, and hit the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you so much and have a fantastic day.